year ECTC 2020 attendee, we would like to welcome you to session 22, Advanced Biosensors and Bioelectronics, organized by Emerging Technologies. My name is Zhuo Li from Fudan University, China. I am one of the co-chairs uh, co of this session, along with my colleague, Jai Wang Zhang from KAIST, Korea. Our first talk will be given by Musa Mohammed from Georgia Institute of Technology. The second speaker withdrew his talk, so it will be followed by the third speaker, Aslan Alam from UCLA. The fourth talk will be given by Kang Ni Niu from Southeast University in China, and the fifth by Yu Chen from A Star Singapore, and the sixth speaker is Sky Yahya bin Said from um, Florida International University. We will close the session with our seventh talk by Saran Raj Kurumoswami from Michigan State University. Hello everyone, my name is Musa Mahmoud and today I will be talking about smart and connected physiological monitoring enabled by structural bioelectronics and deep learning. First, some background on, on electrophysiology. Electrophysiology is a measure of electrical activity in the body. Cells and tissues generate this electrical activity through fluctuation of ion concentrations. There are many clinical and rehabilitation applications that you may have heard of relating to electrophysiology, including electrophysiology Electromyograms, electrocardiograms, electroencephalograms, and so on. Electromyography is the measure of skeletal muscle electrophysiological activity. Here, electrodes are placed on the skin to target the activity of certain muscle groups, as seen in the figure. Electromyography is useful for diagnosing diseases in skeletal muscle, but it's also very useful for human machine interfaces, which is what we will be using it for. This is important because over 10% of the U.S. population has some form of motor disability, with over 3 million people relying on wheelchairs to get around. Parkinson's also affects millions worldwide, with 60,000 new cases every year in the United States. Electrocardiography is the measure of the cardiac muscle or heart electrical activity. Placing electrodes on either side of the heart generates what's called a lead one signal. A normal electrocardiogram is shown below the, the figure. Measuring electrocardiograms involves placing electrodes on the chest around the heart. Here we are able to detect electrical activity from cardiac muscle as the heart beats. Eats. This is useful for diagnosing cardiac abnormalities. As you can see in this figure, 
you're able to detect abnormal heartbeats. In this example, we detect premature ventricular contractions in two locations early. This is very important because over 600,000 people die every year from heart disease and it is the number one cause of death in the United States. Electroencephalography is the measure of the brain's electrical activity. This electrical activity comes from ion fluctuations in the neurons. Here we can place electrodes on the scalp in the following arrangement on the occipital lobe and we can measure the EEG alpha wave signal, as shown below. EEG is used for diagnosing brain diseases such as epilepsy, but is also useful for creating human machine interfaces or brain machine interfaces for patients with locked in syndrome or paralysis. This will allow them to interact with their environment without having to use their muscles. The target demographic for brain machine interfaces is subjects with locked in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome is a syndrome where the subject is locked into their own body and are unable to use any motor functions. It is caused by a range of diseases including stroke, brainstem injury, tumors, bleeding, and diseases such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and multiple sclerosis. As mentioned previously, human machine interfaces is an interface where human physiological data is taken and transformed into commands to, in order to control a computer or a machine. Here's an example of a human machine interface. Here, EEG or EMG data is taken, pre-processed, pre and classified into five categories in order to control an electric wheelchair. There are many limitations to recording electrocardiogram or electromyogram using conventional methods. This includes using adhesive electrodes on the skin. Here's an example of such an adhesive electrode that is widely used for ECG recording. These electrodes are rigid and uncomfortable. They, have, they use strong irritating adhesives and they require a water-based gel in order to interface with the body. As a result of these gels they have poor long-term performance and poor long-term wearability as these gels dry out over time. There are also many limitations to using conventional data acquisition devices for electrophysiology. They typically have rigid electronics and housings. They are uncomfortable to wear and they have to be clipped onto the body or taped on or hang on in some other uncomfortable manner. They typically use long wires which are more susceptible to noise. Here are some examples of these devices. First is a typical halter monitor that is widely used for at-home recording of ECG. And another is a research-grade device for recording electromyogram, electrocardiogram, and electroencephalograms. Recording electroencephalography, or recording signals from the brain, has its own set of limitations as well. 
This includes very bulky electronics and very bulky electrodes, including a hair cap. They're very uncomfortable to wear these hair caps and they require gel based electrodes. They typically also use very long wires connected to benchtop EEG systems. They are much more susceptible to noise than more compact systems and they have a lot of motion artifacts. They also lack mobility. Here are two examples, one of which is a wired benchtop EEG. system and the other is a wireless dry electrode based system. They both have their own set of downsides including discomfort to the user and lack of mobility. Recording electroencephalograms using Conventional gel based electrodes has their own set of limitations as well. Here, a subject wears an EEG hair cap, which is covered in the These electrode wells. These wells allow the silver electrodes to interface with the scalp using the gel as an interface. These water based gels are limited by impedance variations as the water dries out during long-term recordings. They also take a very long, long time to set up as each of these wells have to be filled with a certain amount of gel in order to make the interface work. Signals also degrade over time as I mentioned and they're also quite expensive as they have to be used up and they're not able to be re used. In an effort to design an improved platform, we look at some potential improvements we can make over conventional electrophysiology recordings. systems. First, we prefer a dry electrode instead of a wet electrode or a gel electrode as they are more convenient to set up and require no waste and have an excellent long-term performance. Also, we would like to make the devices flexible and compliant to interface with the skin and use lightweight components. Additionally, we want to reduce the number of number and length of water used as they are a common source of noise and inconvenience. We also want to miniaturize the system so it is less noticeable to the wearer. Also for EEG we want to minimize the number of electrodes used for further convenience and size reduction. Finally we want our system to be fully flexible and conformal for the most optimal setup. As a result our group has developed the Skintronics platform a fully flexible and compliant system that allows electrophysiological monitoring on the skin. These flexible multilayer circuits are fabricated using conventional microfabrication techniques but can also be created using a novel aerosol jet printing methods. Overall, we can use this platform to demonstrate real-time monitoring of electrophysiological 
cardiogram and human activity as well as electromyogram and electroencephalogram based human machine interfaces. For the microfabricated electrodes, the skin electrodes are created using a process of layering polyimide and gold. The etching steps are then used to create the pattern compliant electrode. The electrode is then transfer printed onto a backing elastomer which will allow it to transfer and adhere to the skin. For the multilayer circuits, the process is similar but requires additional steps for the added layers if there are two, two conductive copper layers and three insulating polyimide layers. The final device is then delaminated and encapsulated in elastomer so that it can also adhere to the skin. Aerosol jet printing is a novel additive method that is also used to fabricate these electrodes and circuits. The first example, polyimide and graphene is layered in an additive process to create the graphene electrode. After printing, it is transferred to an elastomer in order to transfer it to the skin. process is an additionally similar additive process. This involves layering polyimide and printing silver and vias in order to create a circuit. Final device is soldered and removed from the glass and encapsulated in elastomer. Data from these devices need to be processed and then classified, whether it is for disease diagnosis or for controlling machine interface. Pre-processing involves removing baseline drift and removing noise including 60 Hz power line noise. For classification we have three main applications. The first is arrhythmia or disease detection using electrocardiogram. The next is using electromyogram or electroencephalogram in order to classify intended actions using convolutional neural networks. Once classified, the intention is then tra transmitted to the target. Here's the basic flowchart of the system that we use. The electrocardiogram is designed as a single patch with three electrodes with four fully functional integrated electronics allowing for recording of electrocardiogram and activity data. The data is classified using a deep convolutional neural network that annotates the data based on thousands of EECG recordings of the same lead. Samples of annotated ECG are shown on the right with convolutional neural network outputs and true labels shown. Here we show ECG data along with calculated heart rate and respiratory rates and finally acceleration data with the corresponding classified activity. The ECG classification data
Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Arslan Alam. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Center for Heterogeneous Integration and Performance Scaling Group at uh, UCLA. Uh, and my advisor is Professor Subramanian Ayer. The title for my talk today is a uh, high spatial resolution surface electromyography system using fan out wafer level packaging, packaging technique on flex rate. So this is the outline for my talk. I will go over the motivation intro and introduction to the system that we call flex CMG. I will go over the process flow of our flexible platform that we call FlexTrade. Uh, I'll talk about the demonstration of one channel flex EMG system and I'll talk about the future work and finally summarize my talk. So the motivation and introduction to flex EMG. So surface electron Myography, which is SEMG, is a non invasive technique to measure the electrical activity of the muscles through the electrodes placed on the surface of the skin. Uh, what is the Motivation for this variable EMG system. First, it helps with the ease of use. Uh, as we see over here, that in a child care unit, there are sensors attached through wires. However, if we have a wearable system where it wirelessly communicates uh, the sensing, then we can have this patch attached which also gives a very good conformity to the skin and also removes the wires that also add to additional motion artifacts leading to noise. Moreover, these variable SE EMG systems can also be used for personalized health monitoring where the sensors can be used over a long extended period of time. The sensors are designed for a cost effective purpose and it can also be used for human machine interfacing for example as we see over here Multiple EMG patches are attached to the form forearm arm, where the arm moves and the movement of the arm can be used to control the the 
prosthetic arm. As an example of a human machine, interface system. So let's go over what are the different conventional approaches to make SEMG systems. So first, uh, Uh, there is a rigid PCB approach and here we see uh, the different examples of commercial available systems such as the MC10 Biostamp, uh, systems from Delsys and Data Light. Uh, the cost of these systems on an average is about $1,000 per piece. And we see these systems are quite bulky in size. If you look into the details of one of these systems, uh, for example, the MC10, this is the bottom side of the system. And if you look into the electric integration we see that it has multiple sensors uh, non-volatile memory a wireless module uh, a power man management system a non flexible battery uh, all integrated on rigid PCBs. Uh, so, as such, that the overall form factor is. quite large, the PCBs themselves are not flexible, therefore the overall flexibility of the system is also reduced and although these systems are variable, they lack in the ease of use for the users. So the next approach is actually a flexible PCB approach where all the chips are integrated on top of a flexible
substrate a polyimide in this case. And here we see the multiple package chips are soldered on this flexible substrate. This system is developed at Georgia Tech and it is not commercially available. Uh, moreover, to complete the system, uh, the electrodes are externally attached to the overall system as shown in the figure below. In this system also, the flexibility is overall. reduced since the system uses package chips. To talk more about the system, we compare the flexible PCB approach to the our approach approach, which is the flex rate approach. So in a flexible PCB, it is a chip last approach, which means that the chips are uh, soldered on top of the flexible substrate through flip chip bonding, for example. And as solder is used, it also utilizes the additional steps such as the use of under, underfill. Moreover, because of the use of solder, the pad pitches are generally limited to more than 100 microns. This limits the integration of bay dies on the flexible PCB as a lot of bay dies may have pad requirements of less than 100 microns. Moreover, as we see the top of this system has non-planar package chips and these chips also need additional uh, passivation steps. Overall, the flexibility is limited because of the use of package large non-flexible chips. So on this, uh, in this approach. In comparison, in our approach, which we call flex rate, it is based on die first fan out wafer level packaging approach. Uh, in this approach, uh, 
dyes are directly embedded. in our molding compound and met utilization can be directly done on the As such, there is no need to use solder and also additional steps such as underfill. We have already demonstrated packages of less than 40. microns on our platform as such they dies that require uh, less than 100 microns of pad pitch pitches can easily be integrated in our approach. Moreover, since the dyes are embedded in our molding compound, they, we do not need additional passivation steps in our approach. The overall profile is much thinner than the conventional approaches. And since the die sizes are very small, the overall flexibility of our system is also better than the conventional approaches. And It is based on the bicycle chain approach. Which, which means that as the overall system bends, uh, uh, the small dies do not see. That extreme bending and overall all improving the flexibility of the overall system. So talking about Chairman, 
podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is very great pleasure indeed for me to be able to attend this conference. I am honored and very proud to have the opportunity to speak at this conference. First of all, I want to introduce myself. I come from Key Lab or MAPS or Ministry of Education from Southeast University in China. I am so honored to be with you to communicate with academic questions and ideas. Today, I would like to present my academic presentation, microfabricated surf atomic magnetometers for measurement of weak magnetic field. My presentation will cover the following aspects. In the first part of the report, I'm going to begin with a few applications in atomic magnetometers recently. Then I'll discuss in more detail specific issues which concern experimental process. Discussing the results by using the software. Finally, I will draw conclusions and give the future research. First of all, I will introduce some applications, development process, and advantages of cheap level atomic sensor. In recent years, Researchers have shown an interest, increasing interest in using portable and movable device for measurement of weak magnetic field, such as geomagnetic exploration, unexplored weapons detection, biomagnetic field, and the material defect detection. The first two pictures are the products of current superior magnetometers company. As the first picture shows, QSP has manufactured a commercial fulfilled atomic magnetometers with the highest sensitivity in the world. The second one is Supreme. The company's Jersey Star is the only airborne sensor system that can be used to measure the Earth's magnetic field gradient. The third picture shows the first modular multi-channel system demonstrated by the William team in 2012. It is a four-channel optical fiber surf magnetometer coupling system, which can be used for the measurement of cardiac magnetic magnetism. The last picture is a shallow stratigraphic profile used to detect geological structures. The reason why the chip scale atomic magnetometer is solid is that the optically bound magnetometer has the following advantages compared to the superconducting quantum interference devices that we call it squids. First 
of all, a sensitivity can reach or even exceed the speed. Besides, because of its correspondingly high frequency, it has obvious advantages for the detection of dynamic magnetic signals of moving targets. In addition, the atomic magnetometer is small in size and high in spatial resolution, enabling wave level manufacturing with the lower cost and power consumption. This paper focuses on the detection of signals of weak magnetic field using a highly sensitive soft magnetometer based on a microfabricated alkaline metal atoms. And next, I will show more details to you. In the second part, I will introduce the experiment, including the principle of operating in the sub region, the manufacturing and the testing process of the chip scale sensors. The soft magnetometer detects a weak magnetic field measuring the lemma precession of spin polarized atoms under the magnetic field. The lemma precession frequency of the magnetic field B0 can be expressed as the equation. The equation is here. Well, the omega is the lamo precession frequency, and the gamma is the gyro magnetic ratio of the rubidium atoms, which is a constant. As is shown in the figure, the soft region should be operated under the circumstance of high density of ocular atoms and extremely low magnetic field so that it can maintain the state of polarization. The principle of operating automatic magnetometers is to, to exploit the energy structure of the ground and the excited states in which the atom can be polarized to measure the magnetic field. Besides, the sensitivity of 
the magnetometer depends on the signal to noise ratio and the line ones of the marine signal. This is the signal to noise ratio and the delta B is the line length of the same Renaissance signal. According to the equation, how to improve the sensitivity? The answer is that the Renaissance really signal can be enhanced by increasing the number of spinning atoms and increasing the variable density or using. In a larger chamber. The noise of the magnet Field should be reduced used if possible. And ensure the stability. The of optical detection system. Some of the lasers, especially, truly distribute feedback that Calculators are stable. And easy to tune. Allowing if Jimmy Noise optical rotation measurements.
Nachts. Äh, Manufacturers of chips scale sensors for a parade. Operation of vapor cell is a key. to the magnetometers in the sensor. Mass process knowledge is used to macrofabricate the rubidium label cell. Operate the light in the one line. Optically bombs the electrons of oxalic and metal atoms, which is in the state of polarization. Absorption uh, of the Circularly polarized slides by the polarized alkali metal atoms in the vapor cell enables to detect the light polarization plane. Is related to projection of atomic spinning in the direction of the
Hello everyone. My name is Yu Chen. I am from the Institute. Like electronics, A star Singapore. Today is the title. On my presentation is developed. of long-term stable Multiple eyes like the sensors. For agriculture and agriculture.
future applications. This work is a collaboration. work of the two institutes of which are I mean and I am I Institute of Materials Research and Engineer. Here is the outline of this talk. First, I will give an introduction to smart agriculture and the importance of the military sensors. Secondly, I will explain what is ion selective electrodes and how it can be used for ion sensing. After that, I will explain the work we have done to use ion slick electrodes for ion sensing. This will include the design of the device, the memory circuit, the testing result, including Sensitivity, selectivity, and stability. At the end of this talk, I will give a short summary of this work. 
and say something about the future of this project. Smart agriculture is a management concept. It is targeting to provide the agriculture industry with the infrastructure to leverage advanced technology. So that the growth of the plants can be tracked, monitored, automatically analyzed and controlled. Smart agriculture will be the future of farming. The purpose of smart agriculture is to increase plant yields decrease the cost and at the same time protect the environment from any possible aspect Monitor and control of the environment condition is a fundamental of smart agriculture. Choose the temperature, night, oxygen level, carbon dioxide, level, humidity, pH level. and nutrient conditions. Of the soil or water. A lot of
technologies have already been used. Hello to all. I am S.K. Yahya bin Saeed from Biomedical Engineering Department of Florida International University. Today, I'm going to present on 3D heterogeneous and flexible package integration for zero power health monitoring. So, let's start. So, this is the outline of this presentation. I'll talk about wearable health uh, monitoring and market analysis, objectives and challenges, passive sensor system and antenna design, cheap on flex and modeling of flex assembly, and time embedding in flexible substrates. Recording medical data was once a difficult job requiring a special purpose medical devices. These medical devices could only be used in a medical facility due to the cost, size, and complexity of these devices. However, in recent years, we have seen new disruptive innovations in the world of wearable technology. Advances that can potentially transform life, business, and the global economy. The spread of smartphones, smart watches, and business trackers, we are accustomed to keeping sensors and computers on or near our bodies. Much of the time, because of our intimacy with these wearable devices, we can now afford to use these sensors to collect our health metrics on a regular basis. The powerful sensors in these devices can track how many steps we have worked, how, many, how much calories we have burned, as well as stress level, quality of our sleep, blood pressure, sun exposure, and glucose levels, and so on. These are all the information needed to get a full picture of our health. If a healthcare system becomes more personalized with the help of wearable devices, it could become a more personal healthcare system where doctors spend more so now let's look how wearable devices influence the market. According to a new report from Practica, worldwide shipments for healthcare wearables will see rise from 2.5 million in 2016 to 97.6 million units yearly by 2021. By the end of that period, the market intelligence fund predicts that the global healthcare wearables market will account for 17.8 billion in annual revenue. My research objective is to devise a low or zero power mirror recording system, which is, which is flexible, wearable, and real and it would be ultra miniaturized band aid like patches. So, here, zero power recording is that uh, my device doesn't have any uh, power sources or active devices that need power. And the device thickness would be uh, 100 to 400. And it has a multi-function ability. That means it will include heterogeneous sensor devices on a flex. And the other thing that I have in my device is that it will be reusable. Here is a classic sensing system architecture, which is developed by Dr. John Volakis at Florida International University. 
So this system has uh, maybe two parts, wireless from the passive implant and the external internal gateway. Basically, an, uh, an external external integrator sends Heisman Giga signal to the passive implant. Then this passive implant modulates the signal and send it to the external integrator through antenna. In this slide, I will talk about the new sensor circuit. The proposed sensor consists of two antennas, a multiple and a mixer. The first antenna will receive RF power at f gigahertz frequency. Following that, a passive multiple will double the frequency to 2 at f gigahertz and send to a passive mixer, while a low frequency signal will be added to the mixer as well. Consequently, the output uh, will be backscattered to a transmitter antenna that operates at twice as mount. A systems level simulation uh, has been done uh, via EM simulation software. The RF carrier is considered to generate at 6 gigahertz signal. For the simulation, commercial of the shelf component parameters corresponding to the multiplayer and mixer were used as per the data. The input of the multiplayer is fed by a 6 gigahertz signal resulting in the output being doubled to a 12 gigahertz RF carrier signal. The output is sent to a mixer local oscillator port. A low frequency signal representing the neural signal is input to the mixer. And therefore, uh, the RF output of the mixer is a signal that is shown in the graph. The sensor circuit link budget is analyzed to predict the sensitivity to neural signals. The external transmitter circuit transmits 22 dBm power, where the antenna on the transmitter side of the reader has the gain of 5 dBi, assuming no system loss. Phase path loss is estimated to be 15 dB when the distance between the transmitter, transmitting and receiving antenna is 5 cm. Receiving antenna gain is 5 dB as well, so total power received is 17 dBm. Following that, assuming low, low system loss in package, assuming no system loss in package, 12 dB is consumed by the passive multiplier resulting in 5 dBm output of the multiplier, which acts as the input to the mixer. The mixer needs 1 dBm to be turned on. Next, minus 90 to minus 130 dBm power, representing the neural signal generated by the signal generator, is fed to the mixer chip. Eventually, the output of the mixer is transmitted by an antenna to an external reader circuit. With the miniaturized high permittivity microchip patch antenna that is fabricated on the flexible substrate, the signal can be retrieved with high performance reader to demodulate neural signals that are tens of microvolts with this approach. With much higher parametric direct clicks, the overall sensing patch can be reduced to the order of few millimeters. Now let me talk about the physical system layout. The proposed 3D heterogeneous snake sensor package comprises antennas on the top, uh, while the middle layer supports the mixer and the multiplayer chip and the neural electrodes are on the bottom. A 3D cross section of the system is shown in the figure. The top communication layer is designed either with two distinct antennas or a single dual band antenna for the receiver and transmitter, respectively. The middle layer consists of thin flexible LCD substrate to accommodate RFIC and transmission lines. The antenna layer is connected to the RFIC layer with uh, two views. And system integration architectures of the antenna and RFIC in CD and 3D architectures are also shown in the this figure. As they already have described sensor circuit and physical system layout, I will talk about antenna miniaturization and materials. One of the key challenges in this project is miniaturizing antenna with bandwidth and efficiency targets. As there are several techniques to make small antennas, I chose high K and multi 
low frequency piezoelectric material. Here, pair of antennas with different sizes based on different dietary constants are shown. However, I will brief, briefly talk about my new approach on antenna miniaturization in the next slide. The geometry of microstrip patch antenna is shown in figure and it was optimized to be operated around 6 GHz. Usually a microstrip patch antenna consists of ground plane and radiating plane on top of the ground plane and a dietary substrate that separates the ground plane and patch. In order to miniaturize the patch antenna, flex flexible partial stabilized zirconia tape is utilized as substrate. The dietary constant of the flexible tape is around 7 with dissipation factor of 0 0.03. And the thickness of the tape is 125 micrometer. And here in the figure, uh, I'm showing the process flow of stacking each layer of zirconia tape for making the substrate for patch antenna. Now, since I have already said that I will give a glimpse of my innovation on antenna miniaturization in the previous slide, so here we go. With my novel approach, a patch antenna operating at 4.6 gigahertz is is reduced to 82% in terms of dimension compared to antenna on LCP. And the effective parameter is, effective parameter is 17. Mechanical modeling of sex assembly is necessary to estimate the interconnection stresses and optimize the assembly stack, material, process, and geometric design rules. Um, cheap on flex assemblies consist of a thin, flexible substrate, linear interconnections, copper traces, and terminations. 14 bodies have been constructed with ANSYS to model the assembled module. All parts are bonded to eliminate any normal or tangential movements. Elastic material properties are added for linear analysis simulation. The young modulus of silver LEC was assumed as 6.7 gigapascal with poison ratio of 0.37. Corresponding properties for LCP are assumed as 3 and 0.34 respectively. PVMS modu modulus and poison ratio are 0.36 megapascal and 0.5. And geometry is shown here, here in this slide. So the silver adhesives provide interconnections from the top face of the traces and the bottom face of the die. Three standard pipes of 10, 25, 30 microm micrometer are chosen for the study. The thickness of the substrate, um, die, and the contact of traces remain constant are, and are 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.05 millimeter. respectively. The cost sectional model of 30 microns stand of five is illustrated in the figure. So So with lower stand of heights, the silver edges is tend to deform more causing higher on phone micro stresses on the substrate and interconnection. To ensure the Reliability of the chip on flex if the higher stand of height leads to lower bone mass stress 
on the silver edges is for better. Flexibility. However, this is not practical with low cost energy manufacturing. And last one, in case solution that also acts as an under the field is another design, design and process modification that can reduce interconnection stresses. The model is set up at a given temperature of 120 degrees Celsius and cooled down to 227 degrees Celsius. At 10 millimeters displacement is then applied to one side of the substrate and the fixed constraint is applied to the opposite side. The mesh span angle center is appropriately chosen to set the goal for curvature. Uh, on the boundaries, uh, uh, of the model, the mass should sub divide in the curved region until each element of the mass spans the angle. In these conditions allow the geometry to bend in one d to analyze flexibility and Sub subjected displacement. The effect of encapsulation of silver additives Summarize the figure as well that that the right side, bottom right side. Figure from the right and the left show the isometric G of stress maps in interconnection of 10 to any 30 micrometer standard height. Higher standard height reduces the bond mass stress in the silver and interconnection. For example, with un with un encapsulated assemblies, the standard height of 10 micrometer results in a bond mass stress of 22 megapascal. This approximates twice the stress of an assembly with 30 micrometer standard height, which is 11.8 megapascal. Interconnections with higher standard height generate lower stresses on the silver adhesive. Uh, the maximum bond mass stress in the substrate is a strong function of its thickness. With thinner substrate, 
of less than uh, 50 micron stress is a strong function of thickness. Uh, the effect of standophyte is less prominent and capsular. In this, the variation in the maximum bond mass stress is substantially less with varying interconnection heights. The maximum stress only varies from 13.08 to 15.90 megapascal with change in the interconnection standard height from 10 to 30 micrometer. For the small standard height, the maximum stress are thirty percent lower than the observed those with encapsulation. Here, I would like to talk about modeling of low loss interconnect and fabricated on flex. The top right figure shows two dB of microstrip to VL to microstrip on low loss LCP. Simulated result of transmission line and VL losses shows that with varying weight, insertion loss is insignificant. Let's go to cheap on flex fabrication. Flex package are fabricated with blue chip assembly on thin LCP substrates. Double-sided copper clad LCP with 50 micrometer core thickness is patterned to form microstrip signal input and output transmission. To the multiple multi pair tile. The multi pair bear tile operates uh, between frequencies of 2 giga to 40 gigahertz. Based on the substrate dielectric concept and thickness, 50 on transmission lines are designed for receiving and Are a signal to the Hello, everybody. Welcome to our talk. Um, my talk is titled A Compact Wireless Passive Breath Analyzer for Health Monitoring. We are from Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from Michigan State University. I am Saranraj Karpuswamy. I would like to thank my co-authors, Saikat Mundal, Deepak Kumar, and Dr. Premji Chahal for helping with this work. Um, let me give you a brief outline of my talk. I would like to introduce what my problem is, uh, followed by why we are doing what we are doing, basically the motivation, a little bit background on our uh, research and the uh, material available in literature. And then we move on to the core concept of the paper, which is basically capillary condensation, the theory behind it and how it is related to sensing different volatiles. Then I will focus on the two different design and fabrication uh, uh, of two different sensors, followed by uh, measurement results and then some concluding remarks. So basically, uh, what uh, we want to achieve here is to propose uh, and demonstrate a wireless breath analyzer, which is completely passive in nature which means it does not require any additional external power for operation. So typically, uh, breath analysis is done to find out what are the different constituents of uh, the breath. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, volatiles, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water, and so on and so forth. So um, in a, a conventional system, uh, this is a typical handheld device, but it is normally battery powered. So we want to replace this conventional system to a, a passive system, meaning a battery-free system. So um, what are the advantages of uh, analyzing human breath? First, uh, the constituent of human breath is a good health marker, which uh, uh, shows uh, the indication of 
occurrence of maybe diseases or the, the nature of the health of the person. So in, it can also indicate uh, the blood alcohol content as well as, uh, you know, uh, if say some person consumes alcohol which may be adulterated which has uh, uh, more methanol than uh, IPA and uh, it may lead to poisoning. So basically the constituent of the breath allows the medical workers to perform predictive uh, health maintenance strategies so or predictive treatment. And of course it is a biomarker for onset of different diseases say uh, you know there may be certain levels of uh, ammonia in your breath or maybe a certain level of different volatiles in your breath if you have maybe a kidney problem or a liver problem uh, so on and so forth so this is the uh, advantage uh, of uh, having a, a rapid uh, detection uh, point of contact uh, kit like uh, what I'm proposing here where uh, you can uh, do predictive health uh, 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 treatment uh, in a very short time. So what is the goals? Goals are to develop a low-cost system which is completely battery free which has a very good sensitivity and selectivity, meaning it's able to uh, show accurately the percentage of uh, different constant of breath. should be wireless in nature. It should be real-time, non-contact, as well as field operable. So basically, we want to have a low-cost uh, battery-free sensor, which can uh, profile uh, breath volatiles. So um, what is the motivation? Like I said earlier, uh, we want to provide rapid, uh, uh, provide a rapid result uh, instrument for point of care application, which means which helps in improving uh, preventive diagnosis, and also uh, it is uh, this rapid detection technique also allows uh, people uh, uh, like uh, law enforcement to uh, figure out if a person has. Uh, um, a high blood alcohol content or uh, uh, and so on and so forth so that's the motivation uh, what are the different current techniques of volatile sensing available in literature so basically it starts with electronic noses there are colorimetric analysis and then traditional laboratory techniques like gas chromatography mass spectrometry and finally the most important topic which we are more interested in which is the microwave sensors so there are typically two types of microwave sensors. They are either active sensors, which are either battery powered or solar powered, or passive sensors, which are either chipless or chip enabled. So these do not have an external uh, power source for activating it. And so it basically harvests the energy from the incoming signal and then uh, uh, senses uh, using the sensing element and returns back the backscattered signal. So there are two types. And we focus mostly uh, on the passive type. And uh, here is uh, there are some uh, wireless methanol sensors available in literature in the last five years. Here is a comparison to show how our work stands among the rest in the literature. So our work is of course wireless passive and can uh, sense uh, five milligrams per liter of uh, uh, methanol. So. Uh, here now we move on to the core concept uh, of this paper, which is basically capillary condensation. Um, capillary condensation starts with Kelvin's equation. So um, what uh, this equation tells us is for a pore, a porous substrate. So basically, um, if a substrate which has pores, these pores have a certain radius of curvature. So based on uh, the liquid uh, which is impinging on these pores. So say, say for example, there's a substrate, there are gas molecules, the gas molecules impinges on the pores, and then at a certain partial pressure, uh, it condenses in forms liquids. And that's what uh, this relationship tells us. So, um, First, to explain this relationship, uh, let me go ahead and explain what adsorption means. Absorption is basically adhesion of atoms, ions, or molecules from a gas to the surface. So uh, anything which impinges on the surface adsorbs first. 
and after absorption at at certain uh, 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 point uh, you know multiple uh, so first a single layer is absorbed followed by more layers of molecules at at one point because of the pressure differential between outside and inside the pores it condenses to form liquids and that process is called capillary condensation that uh, condensation is governed by this kelvin's equation so here is a concept so first uh, these uh, purple uh, dots are basically the gas molecules they impinge on the surface which has pores they form a single layer of uh, uh, they are they form a single adsorption layer which is called as monolayer adsorption followed by this if they uh, more concentration of gas is present they absorb on on top of the single monolayer to form multilayer adsorption and depending upon the pressure differential between here and here at certain point they condense into the uh, pores so this process is called as capillary condensation now so how is this capillary condensation going to help us with sensing so that's what we are going to see here so um, here is an example say say consider uh, that this is a, a porous substrate and these are different pores and this uh, green uh, dots are the volatiles and this is the condensed liquid so consider these blue things to be uh, say two parallel plate capacitors and uh, these red lines are the fringing fields between them so what happens is as these volatiles uh, from condense from gas to liquid they affect the fringing fields which in turn affect the capacitance between these two plates and this effect uh, can be translated into a resonance frequency shift if these capacitors are coupled to an inductor forming an lc tank so uh, um, you know uh, you can use uh, this uh, a relationship uh, of uh, how much this capacitance is affected to elucidate what is uh, being uh, condensed into the um, uh, the substrate so first of course we uh, there will be a monolayer absorption uh, this is followed by a multilayer absorption and then uh, the adsorbed vapor condenses into the liquid filling the pores this changes the effective dielectric constant of the pores this in turn affects the uh, capacitance between those two points and of course if they are connected uh, with an inductor they form an lc tank and that shifts the resonance frequency and this uh, resonance frequency can be uh, frequency can be correlated with the uh, uh, type of liquid which is being condensed okay so uh, this relationship between affected dielectric constant and the condensed volume is governed by a uh, equation called as uh, uh, lichnikar rother equation this is basically a mixing equation it is well studied in literature there are a lot of papers which goes through different models and here at for the purpose of demonstration i am choosing a very simple direct weighted model which means there is no weights associated with these epsilon r the alpha is 1 so let me explain what this equation is so for uh, for this substrate there are only three parts uh, or three different epsilon r's which is basically the epsilon r of the substrate material itself which is fixed which is epsilon sub the epsilon r of the liquid which is being condensed which is also fixed which is epsilon liquid and then the epsilon of the air uh, where it is there is no condensation happening which is basically epsilon air so all these three items are fixed and then let me explain what phi is phi is basically the porosity the uh, porosity is the amount of volume ratio uh, where it is uh, porous versus non porous and it is always uh, between 0 and 1 so this is also fixed because it's a known quantity so the only thing which changes is the volumetric fluid content which is basically the amount of uh, liquid which is condensing in so that is also uh, 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 you know in relation to amount of like uh, gas which is pumped in so uh, this relationship in this relationship the only variable content is the volumetric uh, uh, fluid content and so the more the liquid condenses the effect epsilon r increases so that that is the take away from here so this gives a relationship between the change in dielectric constant as well as condensed uh, with uh, condensed volume all right so uh, 
uh, we will see how this uh, formula takes into effect in uh, the actual measurement data later but now let me show you the uh, SEM images of this uh, uh, the substrate which we are using here we are using a porous Rogers duride 8000 substrate uh, you can see that these are uh, these images are at different resolution and as you can see that at a uh, hundred uh, so you know is there one micron these are, these are smaller pores and within those pores you can see even more smaller pores and then uh, if you zoom further in into her uh, into one of these pores you can further see smaller pores so this shows that this uh, substrate is like a really porous substrate and based on this uh, radius of curvature of these pores we can uh, you know different liquids condense at different rate okay so uh, uh next let me move on to uh, design and fabrication so to demonstrate this concept there are two different uh, designs approaches we choose the first one is the uh, traditional lc tank where you have an uh, uh, inductor and a capacitor coupled together uh, which uh, the resonance of it is picked up using a pickup coil which is connected to a uh, vna for analysis Another is the sensing element is connected to a digital modulation circuit which converts the uh, change in uh, epsilon r to uh, bits and then that is transferred uh, back to the reader. So uh, for for this uh, the sensing element is basically a simple interdigital sensor um, which has uh, uh, 10 pairs of fingers with 250 microns spacing in between them as well as the width of the fingers 250 microns. So this is the sensing element. Uh, for the first case, a uh, commercial 100 micro Henry inductor is connected in parallel to this and then uh, it is uh, used for the wireless traditional lc tag uh, interrogation for the second case we need to connect this to a modulation circuit and that is connected to an antenna so here we choose a simple antenna which is a folded dipole which operates at 915 megahertz and that antenna is connected to the digital modulation circuit which is further connected to the sensing uh, uh, element. So uh, this uh, uh, digital modulation circuit consists of, of course, the antenna followed by a uh, energy harvester, which converts the uh, power for to powering up the ADC as well as microcontroller, and then the uh, microcontroller generates identification bits, and it also power. Uh, 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 controls the ADC, which converts the change in uh, resistance or basically the change in uh, uh, the epsilon R value of this uh, sensing element to digital bits, and that is uh, modulated over the antenna and transmitted out. So the details of this are found in our previous work. We can you can uh, refer it from our reference. This is the circuit uh, for for uh, for this, uh, uh, this the completed circuit uh, PCB for this uh, device so first thing is we want to test the simple lc tank um, for this the lc tank is placed in a chamber so here of course we, uh, as i said earlier uh, this uh, there is a 100 micro henry inductor in parallel to these two uh, legs and that forms the lc tank and that is uh, placed in a five liter glass jar which uh, the which is capped and which is covered, uh, sealed using a clay uh, to prevent air from entering in or leaving out. Uh, the top of the, the lid of the jar has uh, small holes in it through which capillary tubes are introduced. A syringe is connected to the capillary tubes so that it uh, uh, injects a different uh, drop by drop the different volatiles which are under test. So here is the measured results of an unloaded tag. Um, which is basically just air, there is no loading. Uh, you can see that the resonance frequency of the tag is at 2.8 megahertz. The next setup is for the digital tag. So uh, once uh, for, uh, for, for, um, for here, so what we do here is we take this tag and uh, have a 100 ohm induct uh, uh, resistor across it. And then that is uh, basically RV here, which is the variable resistance. And the change in that resistance is what is modulated and uh, is transmitted. And so that is being transmitted uh, here and that is received using a receiver antenna. And then we have a simple uh, 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 circulator with mixer uh, demodulator circuit where, uh, where we demodulate this uh, digital information and we see this information through an oscilloscope.
So here is the uh, result for the unloaded tag, which is basically the red one represents the sensor bits, whereas the black one represents the identification bits. So this is for the unloaded case. Okay. So uh, uh, for the first experiment to see the validity of the sensing element, we measured uh, different concentration, uh, the change in uh, resonance for different concentration of uh, introducing methanol into the glass jar. As you can see that as the concentration of methanol increases from 0 ppm to 25 ppm, the, uh, uh, the peak shifts left, which means it reduces in frequency, which is uh, uh, what is expected. Basically, resonance frequency decreases with increasing dielectric constant. This is the phase plot for the similar um, similar uh, experiment. So here is a consolidated plot which shows uh, that the, the delta frequency, the delta is between the, um, uh, you know, in reference to the unloaded tag, the change in uh, uh, resonant frequency with reference to unloaded tag. As you can see that as the concentration increases, uh, the change also increases uh, linearly with an R squared value of 0 0.994. So this shows that uh, the sensor is working well uh, as it is supposed to be and it can pick up at least 5 ppm of uh, methanol in air. Next comes the digital sensor part. For this, we slightly modified the uh, experimental procedure just to show uh, proof of concept that uh, we can uh, detect a different uh, methanol concentration. For that, first, uh, um, we Oh, as I, I mentioned earlier, there's 100 megaohm resistance put across the interdigital sensor, and that uh, 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 constitute this parallel uh, resistance constitute RV, which is the variable resistance of the modulation circuitry. So first, a 10 milliliter of water is completely introduced into the chamber in one go, and we le leave it for uh, six hours, and then we measure the resistance. So basically, we measure the resistance across it, and that is digitized and sent. So this, uh, uh, the uh, the volume as well as time is can be modified, but um, in our future work, we are planning to do a, a very small volume with a very uh, smaller time, but this is just to show that uh, this concept works. Next, what we did was we used a uh, uh, we open the jar, let it dry, uh, let it let the unloaded uh, re resistance come back to the original value, and then we f again introduce 10 ml of uh, mixture, water methanol mixture in one is to one volume ratio. And then again, we waited for six hours and measured the resistance and digitized it. So. Uh, the ID for both the cases is, uh, uh, is chosen to be uh, 101, 101, 001. And here are the results of the digital response. As you can see that uh, uh, the ID remains the same for both the cases. And um, uh, the the, uh, the sensing data varies. Uh, this is for just water. This is for with water and methanol. So, so this proof, this shows that this sensor uh, can be used for any different range depending upon uh, uh, the sensitivity as well as the ADC's uh, sensitivity. So uh, this demonstrates uh, a simple proof of concept showing uh, uh, the digitization of a, um, of a methanol sensor um, in a completely battery-free passive environment. So what are the different uh, limitations and challenges? I just want to talk a little bit about it. First thing, uh, we can improve selectivity by uh, changing the pore size. Um, uh, we can also use uh, specific coatings on top of these interdigital tags to allow only certain volatiles to pass through. And then we can use a combination of absorption, adsorption, and condensation to enhance selectivity. Next is sensitivity improvement. Uh, this can be uh, done by tailoring the coupling between the fringing field and the condensed liquid. There are multiple ways to do it. Uh, we can change the design. Uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, change the porosity. And again, uh, we can do customized substrate with tailored porosity targeting a particular volatile. And then uh, the most important aspect is miniaturization. Right now, it is a tabletop uh, kind of a, a, a setup, but we want to, in, in future, we want to miniaturize it, basically convert this entire digital modulation circuitry into a single RFID IC and package it into a single chip. And then we also want to fabricate this on a packaging compatible substrate and not on Rogers and, uh, you know, make this packaging compatible substrate uh, also porous. Uh, by you know introducing maybe nanoparticles and etching them so uh, these are the some of the limitations and challenges so in conclusion 
I want to say that we demonstrated a passive wireless breadth analyzer for a point of contact application. Um, we showed how capillary condensation can be used for uh, elucidating the different volatiles in breadth, uh, and it can be used for non-contact sensing. Uh, we The current sensitivity is at 5 ppm, but this can be improved, like I uh, su uh, suggested in the limitations and challenges section. And um, uh, finally, we demonstrated a digital passive sensor, uh, which is compatible with any uh, RFID infrastructure or uh, uh, for uh, uh, and which is long, uh, also long range. So again, this is just the core of our whole concept, where uh, this gas molecules impinges on the uh, substrate, uh, they forming a first layer of absorption and then multi-layer absorption followed by condensation that changes the effective epsilon r that in turn changes the capacitance of these two plates and that in turn changes the resonance frequency if this capacitor is coupled to an inductor. So uh, here I want to show a simple example of how uh, uh, what we envision a future supply chain with these integrated uh, sensors will look like. So here for this purpose of an example, we chose a food supply chain. Here, um, what we want to uh, propose and envision is a, a modified RFID uh, sensor, which is in, uh, integrated with a, a, a sensing information with a RFID chip, which is completely dedicated for uh, passive digital modulation with multiple sensors which are capable of uh, detecting multiple different parameters such as electrical, chemical, environmental, and mechanical. So this information can be sent to the cloud and then that can be used to monitor the products as it passes to the supply chain, providing real-time information about the nature and quality of the product. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge the Access Institute for supporting the work, Mr. Brian Wright and Mr. Carl Dush from the MSU uh, EC shop and clean room, Mrs. Carol Fletcher for helping us with the uh, SEM images, and uh, members of the EMRG Electromagnetics Research Group at MSU. I would also like to thank Mr. Karishka Vijayavardhana for his helpful insights on the microcontroller coding. Finally, um, I would like to thank all of you for listening to this talk. Please stay safe, stay healthy, stay positive, and this will all.